All right. Hi, everybody. Day three, JS Conf, we made it. Go team. <laughs> so thank you all for being here for my talk, and obviously for JS Conf being kind enough to let me be here. So this is actually my first talk, so please excuse any verbal typos. <laughs> So I wanted to kick things off with a quick show of hands. I mean, I say this, but I can't really see all y'all because it's kind of bright up here, but I'm going to imagine what happens. <laughs> so who here was once a junior engineer? Trick question, friends, seeing who's the like, cool, cool. <laughs> and who considers themselves still to be a junior engineer right now? Cool, well, you're in the right place. And who considers themselves to be a senior engineer? Cool. And who considers themselves someone who knows everything there is to know about software development? <laughs> oh, I saw one hand. That, that's an optimist over there. <laughs> well, yeah, junior folks, as you can see from that, if you feel like you don't know enough right now, rest assured that you probably never will. So yay for that. <laughs> <laughs> so on our journey into engineering, what unites us all is that we all have to start somewhere. But that can be different places. Maybe you knew from the minute that you locked eyes with a ZX Spectrum or a family PC that you knew you wanted to code, you knew you wanted to manipulate this machine. Or maybe you were inspired by customizing your MySpace profile. Or maybe you did computer science in college as a degree and you fell in love with it there. But wherever we came from, we all end up on this crazy journey. So last summer, my friend James decided to join us and he took the brave decision to career change to become an engineer. So me, being a mostly decent human being, I offered to help. I mean, how hard can it be in 2019 with the finest Google search results and videos and courses online? Well, spoiler, it was hard. Like, way harder than I thought, or I think he even thought, to be honest. Um, so today, I want to share 10 things that I learned as I followed James on his coding adventure. So who is this person standing in front of you? My name's Susie, my pronouns are she, her. I am British, not Australian, so congrats to those of you who guessed that in the Guess the Accent sweepstakes. Um, and I lead the front-end engineering team at a company called Maven in New York Clinic, in New York City, rather. So we are the leading digital health platform focused on women's health, and we provide on-demand video and messaging access to a network of amazing health and wellness providers, and we partner with employers to support their employees through pregnancy, surrogacy, adoption, and return to work programs. So that's my shameless plug for now. Um, also, we're hiring, so that's my other shameless plug. So if you're interested in either of those things, come talk to me later. So my path into this is that I was self-taught. Or I like to call myself an accidental engineer. See, music was always my thing. Uh, from when I picked up guitar at age 12, I kind of knew that was it for me. That was what I wanted to do. So for the rest of my teens and my early 20s, I spent most of my time playing shows in dodgy dive bars and venues across the UK. But after playing my first show, I think I was 14 or something, I was basking in the glory of Nirvana cover success. I decided <laughs> what my band really needed to catapult us to real success and riches and everything else was a website, right? <laughs> So this was the late 90s and early 2000s, and I had no shortage of inspiration. <laughs> the web was a wild west of colors, fonts, web rings, and let's face it, questionable design choices. They were good times. So armed with some cutting edge tools and uh, zero experience, I drag and drop my way to creating my first website. But then what? I had this thing on my computer, and I knew I had to somehow get that onto the interwebs. I heard that hosting was a thing, so I got some Lycos hosting, I think, and I emailed my band's mailing list asking if anyone knew how to FTP things. Now, thankfully, someone did. So some cute FTP wrangling later, I was online. With no experience, no real skills, I had become a freaking webmaster. <laughs> <laughs> it was good times. <laughs> So sadly, archive.org didn't start until 2001, so my 1999 handiwork is lost to the ether, but rest assured, it looked pretty great. This is kind of all that's left of it, and that was in 2001, but as you can see, my taste in fonts and colors hasn't really evolved that much. <laughs> but eventually, I graduated from publisher to front page, and then a definitely very legally obtained copy of MacRudia Dreamweaver. <laughs> Tables and frames came and went, and CSS came along and allowed me to make things look pretty. But still, for me, coding was a hobby. It wasn't a career. It was 
you know, if you had to do a career in computer science, you had to go and do a degree in computer science, right? That's kind of how it worked. So fast forward, I did a, career, a degree in music technology. I worked in retouching for a bit. I worked in IT support for a bit. I had something of a mid-20s crisis trying to figure out what I was doing with my life, in which I considered everything from being a lawyer to a teacher to a social worker. And then I heard about this startup scene thing that was happening in the US. And that kind of sounded like being in a band to me. You know, it's you and a bunch of people and you're creating this product that you're trying to put out into the world in order to be successful and famous and happy or something. So I figured, okay, maybe I don't need a degree to do this. So I decided to learn to code properly. So I read some books, I built some bad PHP apps, and I badgered some people on Twitter until thankfully someone gave me a chance and gave me a job. I was finally getting paid to code. I mean, there were fewer GIFs and there was more databases and servers to play with, but that was cool. So I taught myself Ruby, discovered SVN, and then Git, and I taught myself JavaScript, and then here I am today, foolishly giving my first talk at the biggest conference in our industry, so that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so just to recap, the things that I needed to do in order to become an accidental junior developer, I pretty much needed to know HTML, some dodgy inline styles. I needed to know how to use an FTP client and a generous smattering of GIFs, obviously. So accidentally becoming a developer just wasn't really that uncommon back then. Maybe, as I said earlier, people started tinkering on MySpace profiles and fell in love then. Maybe you got involved editing HTML emails at work or building a Smashing Pumpkins fan site on GeoCity. But either way, there were fewer rules. There was no responsive design because phones weren't a thing. And interactivity was pretty much copying and pasting a Java applet onto your website or maybe a marquee if you were feeling particularly creative. So here we are in 2019 and my friend James. So the main thing about him is that he's a musician, like me. I mean, we actually make music together, but that's a story for another time. But he had a real job in construction. So he was basically building skyscrapers and swinging off bridges and doing you know, real work. But he also produced videos and animations and sound design for video games, so a talented guy in general. And last summer, he decided he wanted to learn to code. So, you know, me being self-taught and having mostly learned through a kind of baptism of fire was like, okay, how hard can it be? What do you actually need to know to do this today in 2019? And to recap, you know, I got my first job knowing HTML, CSS, really bad PHP, and that was kind of it. Object to programming? No. Source control? I probably thought that was a foodstuff. So this is what it turns out James had to learn. <laughs> So you've got the classics of you know, HTML and CSS, but in addition to that, you now have to know about SAS and LESS and CSS and JS and how to fight people on Twitter about CSS and JS. <laughs> um, JavaScript, obviously. <laughs> React and Angular and Vue and whatever the cool kids are using right now. And let's face it, there have probably been at least three JavaScript frameworks come out in the time it's taken me to get this far in my talk. You've got to know command line knowledge, nodes, NPM, obviously Git if you want to collaborate with people. You've got to know about databases and APIs and be a good citizen of the web and understand accessibility. If you want to get an interview, you've got to know about algorithm data structures, responsive design, cross-browsing testing, and obviously what, everyone, what everyone's talking about and how can use this week too. So that brings me to thing number one on my list. And that is it, the barrier to entry is way higher now. Like, damn. <laughs> so, what are some ways that folks get into being an engineer these days, I wondered. Well, seeing that, you know, matrix style downloading information into your brain by mini-disc is not yet an option, these seem to be the three main paths. So there's a computer science degree, classic. It will cost you many bags of money and take you four years. But you'll come out with a really good understanding of the fundamentals of computer science, and you'll be able to contribute as a junior engineer kind of pretty early on. Or you can do the boot camp path, which will cost you some bags of money and will take you, you know, 12, 14, 16 weeks, depending which you go to, and you'll come out being able to contribute again from day one. Or you can do my path, which was a self-taught path, which could cost you, you know, nothing to some indeterminate amount, but depending on how you go about it. And it could take you any amount of time. Which, you know, thinking about these things brought me to thing number two on my list, and that's that coding isn't that open to all when you think about it. 
So I'm not sure if any of you remember the Code Year initiative that happened, I think it was around 2012. But folks like then New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg touted how he was going to learn to code, and if he could do it, then anyone can do it. It was kind of, we were sold this dream that coding's for everyone, it's open to all, it's the future to our society, like, why would you not want to do this? I mean, that's all well and good, but we need to remember that not everyone grows up with access to a computer. Not everyone can take three months off a of boot camp and then spend, you know, 12 to 20K on tuition fees and plus living expenses and loss of earnings. Not everyone's able to work a job or two or three and then spend their time outside of work learning to code. Now, there are great initiatives out there for some boot camps, like being able to pay back by a percentage of your future earnings rather than upfront. There are loans out there, but it's still a huge commitment, and there's no guarantee of how soon, if at all, you'll get a job. So, nevertheless, James chose the boot camp path. And why would you not? It promises a pretty amazing return on investment. You could go from zero to being a developer in 12 weeks. You can, according to some of these bootcamp sites, have a 70x salary increase. Some of them even have money back guarantees. But a fun thing that we learned that was that to get into top tier bootcamps, a lot of them require you to have a knowledge of learning to code first in order to pass an entrance exam to get into a bootcamp that teaches you to learn to code. So that was weird. So his school gave a few resources out there, but he decided that he wanted to do you know, a thorough job and figure out how he could best learn with all the resources available to him. Which brings me to thing number three, and that is that there are so many resources out there now. You know, when I started, it was kind of books and trying things and failing, and that was kind of it. But now, there's so many things out there, which is great, right? There's so many choices, but how do you know which one's best for you? How do you know which learning style's best for you? Where do you start? Should you pay for one? Trying to figure all these things out and what works best for you is pretty much a job in itself. But nevertheless, James started with Codecademy. So if you've not seen that or used that, it's this really great browser-based sort of IDE which gives you hints and asks you questions and gives you the results on the right-hand side. It's just really cool. So his curriculum was going to involve Ruby. So he did some Codecademy Ruby exercises. Great. He would go through the exercises and would meet up during the week, or he'd text me questions. Eventually, he could write methods, and he could do simple algorithms in this browser. He conquered Fibonacci, he could do FizzBuzz, awesome. So at this point, I was feeling like some kind of mental badass. So confidently, I decided the next step would be for him to install Ruby locally. Makes sense, right? So I said that to him, and then he called me. I said, hey, so I went on this site, and it had a bunch of commands with a dollar sign in front. What even is that? So I replied, oh, yeah, that just means you have to run those in your terminal. <laughs> Simple. So he was like, um, yeah, but what does that even mean? What even is run? So for some reason, that question hit me. Not because I couldn't tell him to open up the terminal app and copy and paste that thing from the website in and hit return, and that would do what he wanted. But I guess because at that point, I realized quite how much learning to code involved. I mean, sure, to run something, you're just telling a computer how to follow some instructions. But even then, what does the dollar sign mean, and how do I explain those two fairly simple-seeming things without explaining kind of everything else in computer science? So at that point, it dawned on me that this journey he was about to undertake was huge. He conquered fizzbars and algorithms, but he didn't have the context of how code runs on a computer, that it was just a text file and then how that runs on a server, or even what a server was. All these things that I'd, as it turns out, kind of forgotten and not part of the common vernacular for people that aren't developers. Which brings me to thing number four. Coding's kind of like this giant game of join the dots. But you don't know what all the dots are. And as soon as you join one dot, another one or two or three or 12 more start fading into view. Now, computer science folks, maybe that's less the case for you. You dive into machine code and what binary is through your long degree, so you've got those fundamentals kind of down. But for boot camp and self-taught folks, sometimes we kind of skim over those things in order to get productive fast, and then we catch up later. So for James, some of his dots were starting to fade in. He understood about running code in a computer versus a server. He knew what HTML was. We nudged some other ones forward, like what's an API, what's a database? More things that I'd taken for granted, just things everyone would have some knowledge of, which turns out they don't. 
He learned, a he learned a bunch of Ruby, and he passed the entrance exam for his bootcamp of choice. Step one was complete, awesome. But as it turns out, more knowledge means more questions. He went through the boot camp, and we continued to meet up when he wanted help with something. He built some Ruby apps, and then moved into JavaScript, and then eventually building full stack Rails and React apps, which is pretty great. But yeah, the more you learn, the more questions arise. Ah, console errors. Now, if you've been a developer for a while, chances are these can be useful 70% of the time. But for a new developer, this seemingly never-ending stream of bright red text and scary red background can feel meaningless and overwhelming. And cannot read property X of undefined. I'm pretty sure everyone in this room has Googled that at some point. So what next? Over to Google, right? And then you get met with a casual 50 million results. And within those results, a plethora of probably passive-aggressive Stack Overflow answers to sift through. <laughs> Always fun. <laughs> and that's if, you don't know, if that's if you know what the issue is. And if you don't know what the issue is, how do you know what to Google? And even if you do, how do you phrase the question in order to get the search results you need? Early on, James had been prepending his searches with JScript, thinking it was short for JavaScript, which returns some pretty unhelpful results. The difference between Googling cannot read property X of undefined and React class cannot read property X of undefined is pretty huge in terms of the relevancy of your results. And that's if you have a stack trace to begin with versus just something failing silently, which is always fun. I guess I'd kind of taken for granted how second nature it had become for me to just search things and usually get the right answer and how to debug things when issues arose. Learning to code is definitely as much about learning to debug as it is about actually writing code in the first place, as it turns out. So James learned about debugging and built some frankly impressive apps for someone who only learned to code a few weeks ago. And he got through his exams. He graduated. He was ready to enter the job market. And that, as it turns out, was just the beginning of the next stage in his adventure. So his school set out some guidelines as to what to do to be in with a good chance of getting a job. One of those guidelines was to apply to 50 jobs a week, five zero jobs a week. That's kind of a lot. In addition to that, he had to study algorithms and create new projects for his portfolio, work on technical interview skills, work on soft interview skills, work on his resume, and things like wanting to have a life had to factor in there, and meeting up with other recent grads to share in the general misery and practice whiteboarding. If you're lucky, you get to do code challenges and prep for interviews and hopefully do interviews, but still, it's a, it's a lot of stuff. And all of that is exactly because competition is so fierce right now. There was 20,000 bootcamp grads in 2018, and no doubt more than that in 2019. Something like 65,000 computer science grads, and then however many self-taught folks come onto the market every year. Which is great, because in the USA, there are plenty of software engineering jobs out there. But the problem is, there are very few junior ones. And those that do hire aren't always that great at supporting their junior hires. I have another friend who's one of the smartest, most motivated junior developers I know. And she landed this job working at this venture-backed unicorn startup in San Francisco, which sounds like the dream, right? But she ended up quitting because she got so little support. They just didn't give her any training. They kind of metaphorically took her and threw her into a swimming pool and told her to learn to swim. So unsurprisingly, she ended up leaving that place and now is spending a bunch of money going back to doing a computer science master's because she didn't get the support she needed from that job that should have given it to her. So with all of this, sadly, thing number seven that I learned is that the potential for burnout starts early. So I've definitely experienced burnout myself. I guess the combination of working in a high-pressure startup environment, working fast, always shipping, and making sure that the company stayed together, it was kind of inevitable. And as someone who thrives on being hyperproductive all the time, I really hated feeling that way, and I wouldn't wish it on anyone. As a quick recap, burnout is defined now by the World Health Organization as feelings of energy depletion or exhaustion, Increased mental distance from one's job or feelings of negativism or cynicism related to one's job. And reduced professional efficacy. So James, towards the end of his boot camp, was definitely walking on a tightrope, just about avoiding fully burning out. But he definitely came close, and that was really sad for me to see. And I guess that's kind of not surprising. 
Boot camps require something like 80 plus hours a week of study. Plus the pressure of if you fail an exam, you could end up leaving with a bunch of debt and no qualification to show for it. And if you're someone like James, who didn't go to college and wasn't used to the pressures of sitting exams, which, let's face it, is never fun for anyone, that was a lot. Doing an exam and then having to go straight back into intensive studying and doing coursework in order to not fail and get kicked out of the boot camp, that was intense. I guess I hadn't realized that this pressure and the possibility of burnout could start so soon. I mean, thankfully, he came through it, but plenty of people don't. Even once he gets a job, the prospects on that front aren't great. A 2018 survey asked close to 11,500 tech employees if they felt burnt out, and 60% said they did. The best company on that list, Netflix, had 40%. So the pressure of working in this fast-paced environment and keeping up with the fast-moving field of engineering takes its toll. Which brings me to thing eight. Resiliency is so important. James survived his boot camp brushes with burnout, but now he was applying to 50 jobs a week and getting rejected on a daily basis. I think a lot of boot camp folks get sold this dream of go to boot camp, get job, make bank. That's it. <laughs> But the reality is pretty far from that, and that can be a pretty demoralizing wake-up call. But it's not even just a job pun that needs strength. Being an engineer means keeping up with this constant sea of changes, and that can be truly exhausting. And James got his first taste of this very early on. He had learned about object-oriented programming and then React, where he perfected creating class-based components, because that was one of the main two ways of doing that. And then along came React 16.8, and sorry kids, now hooks the thing. Forget all about classes, you don't need them anymore. So before he'd even graduated, the thing that he'd learned was the right way of doing things was now no longer the right way of doing things, which kind of sucks. <laughs> Coding really is this career-long marathon, and boy, had you better be ready to change your route, your running shoes, and your technique continually for the rest of the race and the rest of your career. So okay, that all sounds kind of doom and gloom, but I guess thing number nine was the thing that surprised me the most. And that's that helping someone learn to code is really great for helping with imposter syndrome. Now perhaps exactly because of that constant struggle to keep up with what's going on in our industry, or perhaps because I was self-taught, or perhaps because I'm just a naturally anxious person, I've always struggled with imposter syndrome. But I was surprised to find that helping James with his coding journey really helped me with that, which had not been something I'd been expecting. In fact, when I first suggested to him that I help him learn to code, I was secretly terrified. What if this exposed to me is not knowing anything? So a quick refresher on imposter syndrome. So David did a great talk on this yesterday, so if you didn't see that, I would definitely recommend watching on YouTube whenever that comes out. So good job, David. But Imposter syndrome is referred to as a psychological pattern in which an individual doubts their accomplishments and has a persistent internalized fear of being exposed as a fraud. Definitely a girl. I constantly feel like someday I'm going to be handed a challenge that I can't solve and I'll be exposed as this fraud that I think that I am. Okay, despite the fact that in 10 years professionally and many more as a hobby, that's not actually happened. Throughout my career, I've definitely downplayed my own achievements for fear of if I was to say, I'm really good at this. Someone would come back and say, prove it. And then the so-called truth would come out. So I know that sounds ridiculous, but it's kind of a pattern I've been in for a while, and I know I'm not alone in that. So I knew that if I was going to be of any use to James at all, I was going to have to face some demons and confront what I really did know and what I really didn't. So that was pretty scary to think about. When teaching myself to learn to code, I felt like I'd kind of skipped over some basics in order to work fast and prove that I was employable and productive and basically to get hired. So being a pretty methodical person, I decided to make a huge list of all the things that I could find that I knew, or I thought I knew, or felt I maybe wanted to know a bit more about. Everything from scope to performance, the event loop to browser engines, all that fun stuff. If I came across something that I wanted to dive in on more, I did. It turns out, for the most part, I knew way more than I thought I did. As I went through my list, studying things and figuring out what I was maybe a bit fuzzy on and checking things off that I actually discovered I was good at, I started to feel a lot better. Some of that gnawing feeling started to subside, and it occurred to me that maybe I wasn't entirely a fraud. 
They also reignited some of that passion for learning new things, which I guess I probably got a bit complacent with as being at a startup. I kind of had to prioritize shipping things over learning things that weren't directly related to my job. So that was definitely an added bonus too. OK, so thing number 10 is pretty obvious. Everyone knows that teaching is good for the person being taught and the person doing the teaching. I mean, even the Romans knew that back in their day. But I guess it never occurred to me quite how impactful it could be. Another factor in my self-taught path to being an engineer was that more often than not, I'd learned things through kind of reading on the internet and basically trying things and breaking things and trying them and breaking them again until they eventually, hopefully, worked. I never had to explain to anyone in real life what I was doing. I never even really talked through a particular function that I'd written and said what it did or saying why things didn't work or exactly what was going on line by line. But I think doing that really helped me with things like technical communication and explaining those things made me think about things in a way that perhaps I hadn't before. And one of the coolest things that happened was that while James was at boot camp, he started teaching other people. He had got a handle on something, and he told me that he would run little impromptu, impromptu tutoring sessions. So he would get some other folks from his boot camp in a room, and he would show them what he knew. So that was really awesome. So OK, I'm getting towards the end of my talk, and I wish I could end this with a nice conclusion about how James got a job and he's living his dream. But the fact is, he's still applying to those 50 jobs a week. He's had interviews and co-challenges, but the reality is, despite his talents, this is a numbers game, and it's going to take a while. Now, for me, as a hiring manager, I will admit, in the past, I've been frustrated by the huge numbers of new grads and boot camp grads applying to mid-level jobs that I posted, ones where we specified three to four years' experience. But I need to remember that each of these applications is a human, and they've gone through some struggle to get there. They have to do this in the hope that eventually, in this numbers game, eventually a company will bite. And we, as hiring managers, we need to hire these folks. And OK, it's hard to get buy-in from leadership quite often to hire someone who won't immediately increase the velocity of the engineering team. And in fact, it will often reduce it at first. But there's a saying that a team of senior developers and no junior developers is just a team of developers. It's so true. Hiring junior engineers who are excited and motivated and super dedicated to learn will elevate your engineering team in so many ways. But just make sure you have a real training program in place, because they deserve that. Don't just hire someone to do the stuff that you're not interested in or too bored to do. So I guess to conclude, I had not for a second expected when I embarked on this journey with James that this was going to be anything other than beneficial to him. But it turns out, it helped me face some uncomfortable demons and I think made me a better engineer for it. So whether you've just started to code, or whether you've just got your first junior job, congrats, or whether you're a senior, grizzled, bitter old engineer like me, try teaching someone. You might be surprised by what you learn. Thank you. Thank you.